Hello, everyone. It's 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and that means it's time to begin another of our monthly Coco Ross Weather Talk webinars. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis. Behind the scenes today, running the technical side of our program, is my colleague, Noah Newman. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here at Colorado State University in sunny Fort Collins, Colorado. For those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we'll be recording this one for future viewing on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. Well, today's webinar will take a look at aviation weather. And if you've ever flown on an airplane, which I'm sure most of you have done, this webinar is for you. We're excited to have with us today uh, Mike Bardot and Rob Kazmarek. Uh, Mike is a meteorologist and graduate of Valparaiso University. He served as the aviation program leader, or he serves as the aviation, getting a tongue tied here, aviation program leader at the National Weather Service's Chicago Forecast Office since 2010. Mike deals with one of the busiest airspaces in the world. He's also served as a, a leap or as a forecaster at uh, Minneapolis National Weather Service Office and the Davenport National Weather Service Office. Rob is also a meteorologist. Uh, he received his degree at the uh, University of Washington in Seattle. Currently, he is with the Chicago Air Route Traffic Control Center in Aurora, Illinois. Uh, Rob has also served as a fire weather meteorologist at the Northern Rockies Coordination Center in Missoula, Montana. And he's also spent nine years as an aviation meteorologist for United Airlines. His specialty is aircraft icing and turbulence. And well, I've been on a couple of turbulent flights in the last couple of years. Uh, it would be really, really interesting to find out what causes that and, and how that affects us. Well, Mike, Rob, welcome. It's great to have both of you with us today. Well, thank you, Henry. We appreciate everyone joining us today. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. If my computer will cooperate. There we go. Well, thanks again, for everyone, for being here. And our presentation was titled, Everything You Want to Know About Aviation Meteorology. And we're not going to be able to cover quite that much in just an hour, but it take quite a bit longer to talk about everything. But we, what we did want to highlight today was really how weather affects the air traffic system. So we're going to talk about things like winds and ceilings and visibility and, of course, thunderstorms. And we'll try to give you a glimpse into some of the details of when we have weather in particular places, how that actually affects the aircraft operation. In other words, maybe your flight's being uh, delayed for some reason and they say it's weather. Well, this will give you some insight into maybe what that weather is and how it's actually affecting things. So it's a pretty complex process, uh, and weather is a big cause of weather of aviation-related delays. A little bit of background about the National Weather Service. Um, as Henry mentioned, I work at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Chicago. Uh, we're considered a local forecast office, and there's 122 offices very similar to this one around the country, which the map kind of outlines. Uh, we have an area of responsibility for northern Illinois into northwest Indiana. Um, some areas of responsibility are larger, some are smaller, just depending on population and, and sighting of the radar and so forth. But uh, we're all over the country. We're a 24-7 operation, 365 days a year. The forecasters here work rotating shifts uh, since we're always here. Uh, we have marine weather at our office. We forecast for Lake Michigan. Uh, not all offices obviously would have a marine program, but by and large, the public program, so the forecast about the seven days, most offices have a fire weather program. Uh, hydrology is a big part of what we do, river forecasting. Uh, we have national centers that help support that as well. Um, but aviation is probably one of our biggest and, and most high-profile programs in the Chicago office. Rob hails from the Center Weather Service Unit, and these are 21 specialized weather service forecast offices that are embedded within the FAA Air Route traffic control centers. And a little bit about air traffic is there are several phases of flight. Uh, one of those is en route. So you're in the air, you're cruising the altitude, uh, you're, hopefully the flight attendants provide you some with uh, some snacks and some beverages by that time. That's kind of what the air route centers are focused on, the en route, uh, the, the longer portions of the flight. Next you would go into like the TRACON phase, that's the terminal radar approach control area. That's going to be the zone closer into your, your uh, main airports uh, within probably 70 or 80 miles of the airfield. And there's another traffic facility that takes over control of the aircraft at that point. And then you'd have the local airport itself, which has a uh, the local control tower, which would have responsibility for aircraft probably within a few miles, basically on final approach and then initial departure from an airport. And so these facilities work hand-in-hand -hand to hand flights off. And it's 
because of the impact of weather across the airspace system, and we may use that term, the National Airspace System or the NAS, um, there's these air route traffic control centers that also have weather service forecasters included in them. So our CWSU, as it's known, is about 40 minutes from our local forecast office. And the one thing that's critical to know is um, we're communicating. The forecasters at the, the local office and the forecasters at the route center, at least here in Chicago, are communicating all the time because what's happening at the airport really drives what's happening in the airspace getting to and from the airport. So we want to make sure our forecast information is consistent. We're, we want to make sure that our information is spread to all the different facilities and coordination among ourselves as forecasters is a, is a key piece for us to do that. In terms of weather-related accidents, safety is, a, is a, the highest priority when we're thinking about air travel and weather. Um, costs and the economy of things are, are in that mix as well. Uh, it's expensive to operate aircraft. It's expensive to delay aircraft. Uh, but in terms of accidents, uh, it's about 20 or so percent of uh, weather-related, or excuse me, aviation incidents are related to weather. It's about 21.3 percent. This chart here shows the breakdown of that 21 percent, how much uh, are attributed to each different type of weather element. So we've got the biggest uh, uh, cause of accidents is wind. Then we go down to visibility and ceilings, turbulence, density altitude, which has to do with elevation and, and heating and so forth, the ability to, to, to loft an aircraft, icing and so, da so forth on down to wind shear. So wind's the biggest problem uh, in terms of accidents. Wind is also the biggest driver of the airspace system overall in terms of the flow of things, how many aircraft can go in and out of an airport, which we're going to highlight here as we talk over the next few minutes. We can break down each of those elements, um, in this case wind, by the, the phase of flight. So the, the bulk of the accidents in this several year period that we've outlined here uh, were due to wind situations during landing. Uh, then we go to takeoff and then down to the approach, somewhere in between uh, leaving that en route airspace and actually reaching the airfield. Um, so wind is a big problem and landing is the, the biggest issue. In terms of the FAA and, and traffic volume, uh, the highest volume is actually centered around probably about 30 or so airports across the country. Uh, and that's highlighted with these green dots. And flow in and out of these airfields alone accounts for 80% of all U.S. air travel. So it's critical that the weather forecast is accurate for these different airports because we're going to see how weather actually affects them. One of the big considerations in determining how efficiently the air traffic system can move is how many aircraft can land at an airfield in a given hour. Sometimes they even go by the quarter hour. So every 15 minutes they're looking at these numbers. And that's really the arrival capacity of an airport. So for example, O'Hare has a maximum arrival capacity of 114 planes per hour. So during optimal conditions, the winds are right, the ceilings are right, they're, they're good, maybe it's a sunny, quiet day you can have 114 aircraft land in a given hour at O'Hare. So the schedule and so forth put out by the airlines uh, will try to match that, that uh, capacity of the airport. So we don't really want to exceed that capacity. Now the problem becomes when we do have weather. So if the wind shifts, we have to change the runways we're using, the ceilings come down, um, we have to space aircraft out more, maybe there's a thunderstorm over the airport which basically shuts things down. We're not receiving 114 airplanes. We can't accept those airplanes anymore. So we have to do something with them. So in what we would basically have to do, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in detail, we'll, we'll slow them down. We might delay them. So maybe they never leave the originating airport. You're flying from New York to Chicago. Maybe you're delayed and you're sitting at JFK because there's weather at Chicago. So the aircraft arrival rate is really a driver of how things flow across the airspace system. You can imagine a delay getting to O'Hare well, that delays that flight getting out of O'Hare, and that's got to be somewhere else. So there's a significant ripple effect that we can see. The 32 there is for the uh, arrival capacity at Midway Airport, which is a, uh, obviously a secondary airport to O'Hare in our case, but it still uh, plays a big role in the aviation operation here. So let's go through a couple examples to show you how weather can affect these arrival rates. Uh, San Francisco is an airport that has high demand with it. They also have a, a fairly unique geographic location being on, on the San Francisco Bay. This is an aerial shot of their runway complex, and their preferred runways are the, the two eights up in the upper right corner and then the zero one, and that just lines up with the compass orientation of, of the, the runways. 
One thing you do notice is that those, air, uh, those runways are actually fairly close together. They're not that far spaced from each other. So what they'll try to do is, if you're landing, in this case from the upper right part of the screen on the two eights, um, you're landing simultaneously. There's planes coming in, landing at the same time, basically. The key part of that, though, is since the runways are fairly closely spaced, is they need to have visual confirmation. They have to see each other as they're on this approach. So one pilot's looking at the other pilot and the other plane, essentially, uh, in order for them to safely make the approach into the airport. So on a good day, this is a chart that uh, can be used to view aircraft arrival demand at a particular airport. In this case, we're looking at San Francisco. If you notice the white line that runs across the top of that graph that's even with the 60, uh, that's their maximum arrival rate. So they can take in 60 aircraft per hour on those two runways that they would be using simultaneously. On a good day, this of course would be 60. But say we throw some clouds into the mix. We have ceilings. Ceilings are basically a fairly solid layer of cloud cover um, that is some level above the ground. In this case, if we have the base of the clouds up at about 3,000 feet or less, or our visibility is reduced to five miles or less, we lose what we call visual approaches at San Francisco. In other words, the aircraft on approach, uh, landing, trying to land on those two runways, they can't see each other. So they, because of that, they have to space them out differently, or really they probably go down to one runway. So for safety purposes and to be able to see what you're doing and getting into the airport, one runway, that's, that is only half of our capacity. So we're down, we're limited to 30 aircraft per hour that can come in to San Francisco when this happens. Now you notice that we've set that yellow line at that 30 mark. All the colored bars, the greens and the reds that are above that line are aircraft that are beyond that 30 rate. So there's more than 30 aircraft expected during those hours. So as the uh, FAA, in their shoes, we basically have to re regulate the traffic into that airport to meet that capacity. So for those aircraft, those maybe 15 or 20 aircraft beyond 30 every hour, we need to find something to do with them. So there's a few options that they have. We can do a ground stop, which basically stops all ground traffic at the airport. We can have a ground delay program, which is probably most common, which means if you're flying from another airport, uh, you're probably delayed before you even leave that airport to come to San Francisco because they're spacing the aircraft out. Remember, we've cut our maximum capacity in half. We might increase airborne spacing. So instead of maybe having 20 miles between aircraft, we have 30 or 40 miles between aircraft as they traverse the country. So you can see what kind of effect this would have and how you know, lowering ceilings, just in this one example, or lowering visibility can really throw off the schedule across the country. We'll take another look at some of the Chicago airports. That's what we're most familiar with here, of course. Uh, this is an aerial view of O'Hare. You see a lot of crisscrossing runways here. Uh, it's a fairly complex airfield. It's, it's large. It covers thousands and thousands of acres. But really, there's four primary runways, one of which just came online this past fall. Uh, and you notice that these are oriented east and west. In this case, north is at the top of the page. And these are the main runways that we're using at O'Hare. So typically, they're either landing to the east or landing to the west. That's their optimal setup. We have an animation here that will, should hopefully run for us here. And this will basically show you the flow in and out of, out of O'Hare. This is what we call east flow. We're landing to the east. And as you kind of watch, all the planes come from all different areas. And they come to certain points in the Tracon area, which is the area beyond the airport, uh, to get into that approach pattern. You do see midway down there in the red with a few flights going in and out. What you notice there is now planes are circling out over the lake. And now they're coming in from the, west, from the east, landing to the west. So we've shifted our arrival configuration, our, our runways. We've changed them up. That was likely the result of a wind shift. We probably had an easterly wind to start the day, then a warm front came through, and now we have maybe a westerly or southwesterly wind at the end of the animation. So it takes time to be able to shift the runways around and shift the airport around. So you have to figure out when that's going to happen. That's where the weather forecast comes into play. Really, you need at least several hours lead time on changes in weather that will have some impact on the airport. So at San Francisco, you know, hopefully they know three, four hours ahead of time uh, that those ceilings were going to come down and they would be restricted. That way, the flights that are maybe three or four hours out, coming from maybe the East Coast, have time to make plans to, to address that. And the, all the flights that are closer in know that, well, we're going to be delayed a while. So they try to mitigate the effects of that. At O'Hara, wind shift. Is, it can be a pretty simple operation if it's forecast, but if it's unexpected, 
traffic can back up. So here's an illustration of uh, the O'Hare operation, the east flow or the west flow. West flow is the preferred configuration because we can take in up to 114 aircraft per hour landing on three runways. The other runways that are there are utilized for departures as well. We have to keep that into account. On east flow from an easterly wind or southeasterly wind, our flow is a little bit lower, anywhere from 92 to 106. Now, it seems like, well, how many days you get with east flow or west flow? Uh, how often would that change? Well, we have lake breezes here in Chicago. Uh, the colder air over the lake and the warmer air over the land do provide a lake breeze, and that lake breeze will move inland, uh, which is quite a challenge to forecast. But often what will happen is we'll have a westerly wind, and then we'll flip to an easterly wind on the other side of the lake breeze. So they'll need to flip the airport around in that case. Now we do have situations where we have maybe strong south winds, and for aircraft it's important to be able to land into the wind as much as possible. You don't really want a, a strong a tailwind component, you don't want a strong crosswind component, but we blow a south wind across those east-west runways, we get that big crosswind. So what we can do in that case at O'Hare is switch over to a uh, northwesterly or configuration landing from the northwest to the southeast, but the problem is there's only two runways, and among other restrictions, we're down to a 56 to 64 arrival rate, so we're really cutting our flow in half if we have strong south winds. So with the thousands of operations that happen at O'Hare each day, you can really slow things down and cause some major delays very quickly if the winds aren't right. So like we were talking about before, is the FAA needs several hours lead time on changes in ceilings and visibility and of course winds. So those flights that are, you know, a long flight they have to know, am I going to be able to get into the airport? Uh, are there going to be other aircraft trying to get in as well? Am I going to have enough fuel uh, if I have to hold? And they, they make contingencies like that, but the planning uh, the further out in time you can forecast these things accurately, uh, the smoother and the more, effect, more efficient their decisions can be. So here's our arrival demand chart like we saw for San Francisco. Here we have an, we're on the easterly flow, we have a rate of about 92. And so you notice that we're reaching that demand uh, on those couple hours in this late afternoon scenario. The time at the bottom is in Zulu or Greenwich time. So late afternoon, we're the afternoon rush, a lot of planes trying to get into O'Hare port, into O'Hare and we just have enough capacity in this setup. Well, now maybe we have a strong gusty south wind that sets up and we have to shift those runways to land more to the south, going towards the south. And we have to cut that arrival rate down to 56 or 64. That purple magenta colored box highlights the excess aircraft that we have to do something with, in this case, to try to uh, get all the aircraft into the airport. So ideally this would be something that we've forecast ahead of time and they could plan for this. This is where a ground delay would pro would program would be implemented. And what you'd probably see is those hours at the 400 and the 500 and 600 Zulu would have many more aircraft coming up towards that line with very few aircraft above that line. Uh, and that would keep the operation smooth and efficient, prevent things like holding, prevent diversions, going to another airport and waiting to come to O'Hare, uh, things that are not desirable from a, a, a customer standpoint and a cost standpoint. So real quick at Midway, we have a fairly complex field there. They can uh, only use one runway at a time. So they can land in basically all these four directions, but only one, air, one, air, uh, one runway can be used at any given time. So their arrival rate is about 28 to 32 per hour. So here's their demand chart. In this case, this is a good day where they're up at their 32 rate. The traffic demand is, is just below that, so that things should run smoothly. The thing about Midway is they favor landing from the south, in this case the four right of the 31 center runways, because they are direct approaches, so they can fly straight in to those, those runways without having to make a lot of turns and so forth. Now for landing to the south, um, instead of from the south, we would normally make a circle approach, so they kind of make this, follow this red line on the side of the page here and land towards the southwest or do something from the other side to the southeast. The problem with that is if our ceilings get to about 1,500 feet or below, or five miles or below, you can't make that circle approach. So because it, there's a lot of visual references you have to do as a pilot um, in order to properly do that. So that's going to cut their arrival rate. So this animation here will show the flow of traffic. You can see this is the start of the morning. Lots of flow into O'Hare. Those are the white aircraft. Now the blue aircraft at the bottom there, they're making that circle approach landing to the southwest and going into Midway. You notice the other thing to kind of pull out from this is the complexity of the 
the aircraft operation over Chicago as a, as a whole. You have air, the stream to O'Hare, the stream to Midway, and how they kind of interact. You also notice that uh, aircraft avoid uh, the downtown Chicago area. We'll skip ahead just a little bit here. And it's pretty remarkable the kind of the orchestration that goes into all this. And uh, the main reason they're um, kind of avoiding downtown, um, they have the Hancock building, which a direct approach would put these flights right into the Hancock. So um, that's the reason for that circle approach in the midway. So here's the other example of the landing from the northwest to the southeast at Midway. You have similar restrictions in terms of the ceiling. We also add another complexity into this scenario is notice all the aircraft going into O'Hare. One thing that we're not showing on this is actually O'Hare departures. So those aircraft have to take off as well. And so we're really seeing probably half the actual flights that are in the area. We'll zip ahead just a little bit. And you notice how the two traffic flows are in pretty close proximity going into O'Hare and going into Midway. So there are certain situations where what they have to do at Midway affects what they have to do at O'Hare. So it's a direct weather effect at Midway, maybe kind of an indirect weather effect at O'Hare. So I'll turn it over to Rob, and he's going to focus on discussion of thunderstorms and some things that they, of course, affect the terminal, but they also affect the en route environment, uh, which is something pretty fascinating to, to look at as well. Okay, thanks, Mike. So when we talk about thunderstorms um, in the NAS and in impacting terminals, um, one analogy to think about is um, when you're driving down the freeway and you know maybe a rainstorm comes, you just kind of slow down maybe a little bit so the, the car doesn't hydroplane. Um, in the FAA's eyes and just safety's eyes, um, flight routes basically get shut down. So you, you can't be on that highway in the sky anymore. It basically shuts down. So basically you need to put that traffic um, onto a different flight route. So um, and for many reasons, the hazards within these thunderstorms are, are pretty important and um, aircraft will avoid them like the plague. And um, we'll kind of talk about some of those hazards real quick here. Um, when we look at um, you know, thunderstorm incidences um, from the NTSB, you can see most of, of the um, you know, phase of flight occurs up at cruise. Um, and the main reason is you know, if a thunderstorm is going to approach um, a terminal, um, basically, as, as, you, as Mike had mentioned, you know, talking about acceptance rates, when a thunderstorm is on a, on a terminal or an airport, um, basically there are no flights um, arriving or departing. So um, that's one of the reasons you don't see a lot of you know, landing or, or approach um, issues with, with thunderstorms as far as a lot of incidents. Um, but thunderstorms are, are big, monstrous you know, um, entities that have lots of power in them. And, and as you'll see here in a minute, I'll, I'll talk about some of the updrafts and downdrafts. And those, those kind of can impact some of the cruise uh, locations um, during that phase of flight. One of the big things um, with thunderstorms, and one of the reasons why we're not you know, going near these things um, during um, landing aircraft is mainly the downdraft scenario. Um, most you know organized storms have these downdrafts. Uh, the wind kind of comes down um, due to just the heavy precipitation drag. And you know, depending on your phase of flight, um, it's going to have different consequences. So if you're on the leading edge here of this downdraft where it's coming right at you and actually maybe providing lift, which is a good thing that you know aircraft wants to be heading into the wind, um, that's actually a good thing. It's probably very favorable. But as this aircraft traverses toward its, its arrival or, or its landing location, it's going to come through the downdraft, um, those two big white lines coming down. And then also it's going to come into a tailwind. Um, so this is something that aircraft need to avoid. Once that tailwind um, sets up, they lose lift. and um, certainly is is a big problem. So this is just one of the reasons why we're avoiding the, these these entities um, as we get near terminals. 
Now also up at flight altitude, um, these storms have very strong updrafts, um, anvils that can, that can affect um, you know, flight level um, zones as well. And here's just one thing to kind of consider, you know, some of the updraft strengths in, these, in a thunderstorm. For a thunderstorm to um, kind of maintain about one inch hail, keep it suspended aloft, we need to have about a 55 mile an hour updraft. That's pretty, pretty tremendous. And that's just for one inch hail. So um, some of these updrafts can, can exceed um, 100 miles an hour or so. And so this is kind of one of the reasons that these um, storms are avoided. Um, I've got a picture to show you next here which shows a very strong updraft, what it did to hail. It actually took the hail, loft, lofted it up and out of the cloud. Um, so even in proximity to these uh, thunderstorms, we, you know, pilots need to be very careful and cautious. And this is one of the reasons why the FAA just, hey, we're, we're going to shut a flight, a flight route down. We're going to put those aircraft somewhere else. So this is a case where um, this aircraft wasn't even, you know, near the thunderstorm. Um, it was certainly avoiding it, and thunderstorm did what it did, and it, it threw big hail balls up and out of the cloud, um, you know, several miles away from the thunderstorm. So when we talk about safety and um, avoidance, this is one of the reasons why um, these things are avoided, and that does affect the NAS. It affects the, the jet routes, which um, are fixed. Those aren't um, variable in the sky. They're kind of fixed routes. So when we look at, um, for example, most airports, when we look at how do the, airport, the aircraft feed into the airport, generally most airports, and this is specifically for O'Hare, but generally this is how it works for other airports as well, um, aircraft arrive on the, the intermediate directions uh, or compass directions, so northwest, uh, northeast, southwest, and southeast. Those are fixed. Yes, certainly there's some different streams here in the northwest. There's a couple of streams that converge, um, say, over north central Illinois, but generally those are fixed. And the reason they're fixed is because we have to also consider um, the departure. So you've got the arrivals coming in, but also you've got departures leaving the airports, and those generally um, use um, the main cardinal compass direction. So we got departures north, departures to the south, east, and west. Um, and here's what that looks like kind of in real time, just to show you um, what those streams of traffic look like. Now this is early morning to start, so traffic volume isn't real high. But as we kind of move ahead to different parts of the day, you know, sometimes maybe the northwest might have a higher traffic volume than, say, the northeast. And that will change um, during different parts of the day. But as you can see, those, those routes are generally fixed. So um, where we run into problems is when we have thunderstorms, which these aircraft need to avoid, um, or maybe blocking some of these routes. Um, And we'll kind of jump to that next. So I want to focus on um, some of these routes that come in from the northwest and the southwest. On this particular um, scenario, I kind of highlighted for you in yellow the northwest arrival routes and the southwest arrival routes. And if these are impacted, those routes will, will need to be shut off. Okay. So at this point in time, as these thunderstorm clusters across Wisconsin and the Mississippi River, those routes in yellow are, are basically shut off. So what the FAA needs to do is come up with a plan. Um, and these plans um, are called playbooks. Okay, so what is the FAA's plan? And again, Mike had mentioned lead time. Um, the FAA really needs to know several hours in advance um, of these types of weather scenarios. So here is a, what the FAA calls a playbook. And this is for the scenario we just looked at with the thunderstorms crossing Iowa and the Mississippi River. Um, the airlines, um, the weather service come together and they talk about timing of thunderstorms. Where might these thunderstorms be at certain times of the day? 
and a consensus is, is kind of developed of um, what is the plan going to be for these storms? So the FAA has a, a list of playbooks that they're going to use. This one in particular, as you see up in the green here, will take all west to eastbound traffic north um, of the thunderstorms. And um, in the purple here, you can see the west to eastbound traffic stays well to the south. So this is kind of a coordinated event. Um, but you can see the main um, arrival feeds into O'Hare, they no longer exist. They've been altered. So this is where um, you know, airlines have to plan for fuel contingencies. Um, as long as these thunderstorms are not impacting their arrival destination, things are okay. They can change their flight plan is, is what they call it. Um, but this is kind of a daily situation. Um, during the spring and summer as we move through convective season to come up with a playbook and how the, how the FAA is going to um, kind of move traffic um, off what we call standard routes. Here is just a um, kind of display for you that really just shows the tra traffic in and into O'Hare and how thunderstorms might impact uh, these normal routes. There we go. So kind of early in the morning, not a lot of traffic. Um, the, the yellow and red are basically you know, tall thunderstorms that aircraft will need to avoid. Some of the lighter greens are maybe just some clouds or precipitation that um, aircraft can generally fly through. Um, but as traffic increases, um, you can see the white flow of traffic. As that increases, you might see um, a situation here where um, there's absolutely no arrivals coming into the northwest and the southwest, and this northeasterly stream is really full of traffic. Um, and occasionally, you will see you know air, aircraft circling, so those aircraft might be holding, um, waiting for for thunderstorms to to clear the terminal before they can safely arrive. This was a very busy day. Um, this was a day where we had multiple waves of storms that moved through um, the Midwest. This was in the morning, but that was only round one. Round two came later in the afternoon. Um, certainly um, in the interim, you can see traffic got you know, back to normal, per se, over, over Chicago. And Things were flowing pretty good until the second line of storms developed along the Mississippi River. And soon you'll, you'll see what happened is that that will cut off the traffic from the west and they'll start feeding these, these inbounds trying to avoid those storms up to the north. And then what the FAA will do with, um, with the forecasters, they'll, they'll try to get timings of when these storms might Im impact the terminal. Um, it's kind of imminent here that these thunderstorms will be impacting the Chicago area. So we really work hard with uh, lead time to the FAA uh, and the traffic managers to say, OK, what time will the airport be impacted? At what point will uh, the airport not be able to receive aircraft? And at what point will these storms actually get to the east of the airport so we can start feeding some of this, some of this traffic from the west back in safely? So, so you can see um, the staging back here to the west. Um, that was probably coordinated to when we can start feeding these aircraft back in. And as you kind of watch these aircraft come in from the west, the timing wasn't really perfect. You can see them start circling over Dubuque there because um, the storms are still um, impacting the terminal. Um, And at some point, they will clear the terminal, and we'll see this flow of traffic kind of getting back to normal. Still waiting. Yeah, here we go. Now aircraft can start feeding back in uh, once these storms clear the terminal. Um, but as you can see, um, the east side of, of the airspace over Michigan, Indiana, really is not being used. So um, all the flow of traffic now is, is in from the west. So 
So you can see kind of a complex situation. Uh, a lot of coordination kind of goes into um, the timing of these weather events. Um, now sometimes um, you may be in a situation where uh, the weather where you are is really good. And you look outside, you see sunny skies, um, weather is really good, but maybe you're going to New York or maybe you're coming from New York to Chicago. Well, this is kind of what, what I call the, um, the sunny day syndrome. Um, and you'll see, got a depiction here of, um, of a storm complex um, kind of in between Chicago and New York. And this is a day where maybe you're flying out to New York or maybe you've got a flight from JFK to Chicago and you're wondering, hey, why am I delayed? Why can't I get to where I'm going? Maybe um, you're going out to New York to Seattle and saying, what's the problem here? Well, it's this big mass of storms that are kind of in between uh, some of the flight routes. So I, I threw some of the what we call jet routes. Um, and these four routes that I just threw up there are, are what we call transcontinental routes. They're routes that bring aircraft from um, the east coast to the west coast or vice versa. And um, this situation, those four routes, well, actually five of them, are all shut off. Aircraft cannot use those. So the FAA has to come up with a playbook. Um, what are they going to do to, uh, where are they going to put traffic in this scenario? So here's the playbook that that they um, kind of devise, and this is for traffic from New York to all West Coast um, airports. But you've got basically one jet route now that are trying to feed multiple airports to the West um, to avoid these thunderstorms. So this would be a situation where there's going to be many delays. Um, the weather in Chicago is good. The weather in New York is good. But in between, there's, there's lots of thunderstorms. So um, the problem is, you you cannot put um, the volume of, of five jet routes onto one. There are certain limitations the FAA has. They have spacing requirements for aircraft. So and this typical, typical scenario would be one that you know, has ground delay programs for all these, all these terminals out in the western U.S. So um, this is kind of a common situation as we go through, through spring and summer. This next little piece that I've got for you is um, kind of a quiz. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event that we captured a few years back and just kind of watched the flow of traffic on this one into Indianapolis, um, kind of gearing up for a, an event. You'll notice lots of inbounds at some point coming, coming from New York in the red. So lots of volume coming in kind of gearing up for an event and um, just think of maybe what this might be. This is a, this is a February sporting event. <laughs> um, but yeah, lots of flow of traffic inbound. Certainly there's no weather overlays on this one, but it's during the winter, so there was really no thunderstorms to deal with. But lots of inbound traffic kind of gearing up. And I'll just jump ahead here a little bit. And at some point you'll see a mass exodus um, after the event coming up here. Now you can kind of imagine if there were say a, a snow event or a mixed precipitation event or low ceilings at this uh, airport on this day, you'd have to put the space between those aircraft, it'd have to be much larger. Um, could you get all those aircraft in and out of that airport if there was you know six, seven inches of snow and low visibility and low ceilings? So just to give you a consideration of how sensitive things are, um, you know, there could be some big changes and big ripple effects trying to get to this particular event. Yeah, so thanks, Mike. And that was, um, you can see the mass exodus here. And I, I, I recall this. This was, um, this was Super Bowl 2012. And, and leading up to this event, um, the FAA, um, certainly like a week out, was kind of curious, hey, what is the weather going to be um, on that day? What, what's the en route weather? Are there going to be February thunderstorms between New York and, and Indianapolis? So. Those are some of the questions that might come up, uh, some planning purposes. Um, so that was just kind of a fun thing to look at, but uh, certainly um, kind of telling about just the number of aircraft that are out there. Um, one of the other um, aviation hazards that we're, we're trying to grasp for the FAA would be turbulence. Um, certainly when you think about thunderstorms and, and a pilot, you know, certainly can see those out of the cockpit 
can see you know how tall they are, but one of the things that they cannot see really um, is is turbulence. They can't really see it. They're kind of in the cloud. Now us as forecasters, we can kind of see it. This visual um, over Iowa shows these kind of rippled clouds kind of caught in the jet stream. And um, we can certainly see this looking at a satellite. So we can kind of give clues to the FAA about where we might have some rough air. Um, and if, if we think about, you know, um, aircraft incidences, um, a lot of these associated with turbulence, they occur up at cruise uh, where, where pilots can't really see um, a lot of this. Um, they can't see it. So they basically kind of run into this. And I'll kind of talk about that in a minute here. Um, and then the next highest level of frequency would be during descent. Um, certainly if turbulence or icing is, is really strong or really severe, so to speak, say maybe in the approach zones as we showed you into Chicago, um, they might, act, might, might have to close those approach zones down. Um, but on borderline scenarios, they continue to, you know, flow traffic through those approach zones until conditions would get, get bad enough. So one of the things that we, we look at daily would be turbulence. And basically turbulence, um, we talk about jet streams, we talk about um, wind shear. Basically what we're looking at um, is within any specific jet stream, is there a change of, of a wind speed with altitude? Is there a change of the wind direction with altitude? So it's not necessarily a function of a jet stream per se, but it's a, more of a function of what might be the changing wind speeds with altitude in that jet stream. Um, something that the pilots can't always see, but certainly here on the ground, we have weather models and sensors that we can kind of look at to kind of give us clues. And I'll just go through a couple of real brief scenarios. Um, and I kind of call this one, you know, all jet streams are not created equal. Um, so I've got a couple of cases that show basically the same type of jet stream. Um, and if you're, if you're familiar with um, weather maps, um, all, these, all these wind barbs, as we call them, are, are basically measurements of the, of the wind speed. So um, if I look over here over southern Lake Michigan, any triangle would be about 50 mile an hour, another triangle 50 mile an hour, so that's 100, and then smaller barbs. Um, our smaller wind speeds, so this is basically about 100 to 125 mile an hour jet stream. Um, so we're going to look at just what we call an atmospheric sounding under this jet stream scenario. And this could be a little bit of a confusing graphic, but I'll kind of quickly explain what it is. It's a snapshot over Grand Rapids. It's um, measuring the wind from the surface up through all different flight altitudes. So now, over this arrow, flight level 200, 20,000 feet, the next one, 32,000 feet, and so on, up to 42,000 feet. And all these numbers in yellow basically represent the wind speed. Okay, so 99, in this case it's knots, 110, 119, 120, kind of a uniform um, wind speed. So this is a kind of a scenario where flight altitudes are very smooth, um, and the jet stream will not pose much of a problem. This next scenario, um, a very similar jet stream um, from the last um, 100, and 100 knots to 120 knots. Um, you know, at the surface, it looks pretty good. It looks like, okay, um, kind of a similar jet stream as we had in the past. But now if you look at um, our wind measurements from the surface down low up high, you see a real big change in some of the wind speeds where the previous example was very uniform winds, and in this scenario, we've got a lot of changing speeds. So we've got 38 knots um, increasing to 71, increasing to 112 knots. So in this corridor here, where the wind speeds change um, dramatically over short, short altitudes, that's where we get what we call um, rolls, so, so the, so the, or, or tumbles. The air likes to tumble and causes turbulence. So this is one of the things that we're looking at daily, and again, so um, there will be certain cases where this turbulence might be strong that the FAA will decide to actually close a jet route, and under really you know bad scenarios, that might actually cause problems for inbound traffic to O'Hare to Midway. Maybe they've got to shut down the northwest and the southwest arrival traffic flows, put that traffic somewhere else. So. Um, 
So as Mike had mentioned earlier, you know, we could go on and on about, you know, talking about different aviation weather impacts, but these are just some of the some of the key things that we're looking at, and um, that kind of concludes um, presentation part here of the of the of the day, and I think we can go to some questions here. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate that. Some some really interesting stuff that I'm sure many of us weren't aware of uh, when it comes to aviation uh, meteorology. Oh, here, this looks like your school. The uh, some of the questions that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so these are the those questions. questions. Gotcha. Not not our viewers' questions yet. It's your questions. Sorry. Yeah, we can kind of we can kind of go over these real quick as well. Um, certainly, some of the listeners might be um, kind of curious about how they answered these questions, and we can kind of talk about some of these. So in terms of the, uh, the percent of aircraft accidents that are weather related, uh, we saw a range of answers uh, from, from the audience initially. And it's, it's actually about 20%, which we talked about earlier in the presentation. And that's divided up among several different factors from with winds being the most primary, going to ceilings visibility, then getting into things like turbulence and, and icing and so forth. So about 20% of all accidents are weather related. So phase of flight. Um, if we, we kind of look at phase of flight, most of those um, really come into play. As we talked about the winds, the winds are being the, the you know 48 percent of of the overall accident percentage. Um, that final approach really is kind of a lot of where where the injuries and accidents occur. And I guess the main reason for that is because they they can't really um, they can't avoid you know landing. Um, they have to approach at some point. As far as all some of these factors that uh, have the most important impact to aircraft travel, thunderstorms is probably the biggest one uh, because they affect not only the airport itself, but they affect the in route flow. As Rob pointed out, you know you cut off a, you, certain streams of flow across the country. You have to consolidate that traffic. You can't fit as many planes into certain spaces, and all overall you get you get delays. And of course, avoiding thunderstorms is critical, as we illustrated with some of those hail pictures. Uh, something you don't want to be flying in or near, especially if you're general aviation. Uh, you may not have radar on, on board. Uh, that's why it's very important to know the forecast ahead of time and see what that potential for thunderstorms is and be able to monitor uh, as you approach your flight time. Yeah, and certainly um, surface winds, you know, as we had talked about, how does an airport determine what configuration they're on? Yeah, that's a big impact, and that's kind of what drives the airport operations, but from a Pure impact to air travel, yeah. Thunderstorms, it's it's a it's a big impact, yeah. Um, as far as turbulence, as I mentioned, um, yeah, certainly the jet stream can cause it, but it's not the main function. It's really what is in the jet stream, um, what type of wind shear and changing wind speeds um, are in that jet stream. Um, certainly, mountains, mountains can actually block the wind um, and cause those those eddies or, or, or rolls in the wind. So mountains certainly, um, you've heard of mountain wave activity in the past, so, so that certainly is something that can cause turbulence as well, yeah. So what causes aircraft icing? Um, specifically, it's the accumulation of supercooled liquid freezing on an aircraft surface. Uh, you can have icing related with thunderstorms and icing related with snowstorms as well, but really it's, it's about the amount of supercooled liquid that you have. Uh, even in a big snowstorm, you may not have that much icing sometimes because you have frozen ice crystals, and snow can accumulate on an aircraft too. But really, the dangerous ice is stuff that can accumulate rapidly and, and cause performance aircraft performance issues and therefore safety issues. Is typically the supercooled liquid uh, that you have in the atmosphere. So that's basically liquid that can still be liquid uh, below the freezing point. So as you can see, there's many many different factors. Pretty much all weather elements that you can think of have some effect on the aircraft operation. And our job as forecasters is to try to pick out when these hazards and these different elements are going to come together to create hazards and then work with our partners, specifically the FAA at the big terminals, um, to provide information that will help them make decisions on where aircraft are going to go, how many aircraft can we take in today, what plans are we going to have to make to mitigate delays. That translates over to the airlines too. A lot of big events, they may preemptively cancel flights, like a big winter storm. Uh, if they can see these things ahead of time, it's about saving, it's about you know keeping things safe. It's about saving passengers' uh, grief and frustration, and it's about basically being able to efficiently and cost-effectively 
run an operation. So there's so many different factors that uh, we as forecasters have to be at least aware of. It's good for us to know what thresholds O'Hare, for example, would, uh, would have um, to change their operation in so that we're cognizant of when those values are, are approaching. And we can alert the FAA if those things maybe change on a short-term basis. So we do have a lot of communication with our local FAA facilities and even national FAA facilities to try to coordinate all this weather and their aircraft operations. So um, I think, if Kenry, if you've got some questions, we've got some time. That'd be great. Yeah, folks, if you want to type in, we're getting some in coming in right now. Actually, I've got a couple of quick ones for you. Um, I was thinking about, so for turbulence and, uh, and, and the wind and so forth, same rules for non-passenger aircraft. So uh, your FedEx and those guys, I know they try to be extra careful when they have passengers on board. Um, will, will they, what, what care is taken for the, the non-passenger aircraft? Yeah, well, they still have you know they still have the flight crew obviously, which is um, you know important. And um, you know from, from a thunderstorm standpoint, yeah, all the same rules apply. They just they will not fly in or near those storms. So um, that that certainly applies. Um, you know, and they they do have cargo that they have to worry about. Um, so that that could be a situation where um, you know a rough jet stream um, might prompt them to change altitudes or change you know their course of flight certainly yeah the other thing to consider about turbulence too is uh, the airframe the type of aircraft you have a small Cessna uh, obviously they wouldn't be flying up at 30,000 feet but uh, maybe a, a small business jet or a regional jet compared to something like a 737 or 747 or a380 something like that so they're all going to handle uh, the situation differently basically because of their size and so um, pilots may take that into account as well. You know, I remember seeing a presentation, I think it was a gentleman from Australia gave about turbulence showing that certain side of a thunderstorm, like an MCC complex, would have more turbulence on the north side for some reason. And is there, are there certain places in a thunderstorm complex that a, that a aircraft would avoid? You know what? Um, Here's one scenario, yeah, um, I think climatologically sometimes these northern sides might have a little more thunderstorm outflow, um, so they certainly look at that. One of the big things that we run into is, for example, say we have storms over Iowa and Missouri, a big thunderstorm complex, the FAA might say, okay, we need to route these aircraft north over Minnesota to avoid the thunderstorms. Well, we see this kind of a, as a common thing where um, right where they route the aircraft, we know we're going to have turbulence because we have thunderstorm outflow because maybe the jet configuration is blowing um, this thunderstorm energy up and out of the storm into a flight route that has no thunderstorm. So that's something we're cognizant of and we, we try to, you know, but there's certain configurations of the jet stream that w would, you know, indicate where might that non-thunderstorm turbulence be. Well, thanks. Appreciate your answers on that. Okay, let's take some questions. Here's one from Karsten in Asheville, North Carolina. He wants to know, what is the most challenging aviation weather variable you have to forecast? I, I think as a, uh, again, our local forecast office focuses on the terminals. We write tasks, and, and we didn't show you an example, but that's basically a coded forecast of conditions of the airport. Wind, visibility, ceilings, you know, weather type, thunderstorm, snow. And I think probably the, the two toughest things actually, and they can be related, are the ceiling height and the visibility. Um, the operation at O'Hare can change drastically if the ceiling changes by 100 or 200 feet. And so to, to be able to have that precision uh, can be very difficult. Uh, numerical weather models, you know, we have high resolution models and so forth that are a big part of, of trying to forecast uh, various weather elements, but at the same time some of the the poorest conditions that are handled by the model are low-level moisture and where it counts the most in the first couple thousand feet. So I'd say that probably ceilings and visibility are some of the biggest challenges and for the forecaster I think the things that can really help them to build a more confident decision in what's going to happen is to a be able to have a high situational awareness. In other words, be able to monitor trends of observations uh, leading up to an event and also uh, having a conceptual model, what types of weather patterns uh, are typically favoring you know, low, low stratus or maybe we have like advection fog in the winter, it's a warm air over a snowpack, uh, something like that. And 
we do a lot of what we call event reviews uh, for aviation at our office, which works at the CWSU on this as well. And we look back, we had a significant weather event of some kind, particularly thunderstorms, winter weather. Uh, what played out? What was the effect on the aircraft operation? How did we perform with the forecast? But then we also database that information, and we can build training for our forecasters that, hey, these are some of the patterns that we've seen before. This is kind of what has stuck out. And so that's a, that's a critical part um, of the forecast process in addition to a lot of the modeling capabilities we have. Yeah, just real quick, sec, you know, just adding to what Mike just said about you know, forecasting the ceiling heights. And certainly the FAA, they have expectations that they need to know, um, is the ceiling going to be 1,000 feet or 900 feet? And that can be very difficult, just as Mike mentioned, you know, we're trying to determine a couple hundred feet of a, of a ceiling height. So, but, those are, but those levels of ceilings actually dictate the number of aircraft that are allowed to land. So that, that certainly can be a challenge. Okay, here's a question actually with a common theme from three folks uh, writing this in. Um, uh, and I'll, ask, I'll put all three questions together here. Stu from Eden Prairie, Minnesota wants to know what ground instrumentation is deployed to detect downdrafts. He believes he's seen these objects in place in, at Denver. Uh, and in and around Denver. And then um, Jerry writes and wants to know how many airports have wind shear detectors. And then also a message, a uh, question from Tom in Tulsa, Oklahoma, are microbursts still a major problem for aviation? So they're kind of all, all hitting the same thing here, if you guys could talk about those. Yeah, we can kind of break that down um, in pieces here. There is a system that's been put in place, and I actually had a slide um, on a previous presentation that actually showed the number of the airports that had um, wind shear detective, detection systems. It, it's many airports. The, the slide that Mike showed you uh, with what the FAA calls those core airports, those 30 airports, um, those all have this, this wind shear detecting, detection system, um, but there's many more airports that do as well. Um, that system is called ITWIS. Um, um, stands for Integrated Terminal Weather System. And basically, um, over the airport, there, there will be these various wind sensors, um, sometimes as much as 10 different sensors that will, you know, they each have anemometers on them, and they're measuring um, the wind speed, the wind direction, but actually at different locations on the airfield. And that, that system um, certainly is, is out there and it's pretty well known and that, that does detect these these microbursts um, so it's a pretty good system out there for that yes um, I guess part of that question was you know do microbursts still impact or is it still an impact yeah even with um, you know the it with system um, yes certainly you know it's a big impact because for example um, an airport might be on a certain configuration. We saw just the other day here in Chicago, we had pretty modest east winds, so um, they were landing into that east wind. We had a, a decaying thunderstorm that kind of came into the area from the southwest, and, and for a brief period, um, that thunderstorm threw out a you know a mini microburst, so to speak, and it shifted the winds to the southwest at about 15 knots. So um, right away, the you know the, the traffic managers and the tower was wondering how long is that going to last? Um, are we going to have to change configuration? So yes, yeah, certainly, um, still a sort of important topic. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, here's one um, from ac actually uh, I'm looking here. This is my nephew down in uh, Claremont, Florida, who's a Coco Ross volunteer. Michael writes. Uh, do airports adjust their scheduled departure and arrival volume based on expected seasonal weather patterns? So different times a year. How does that work? You know, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't know of any specifics seasonally. Um, a lot of times you'll have uh, peaks and flows around holidays and so forth. That's pretty consistent. And then time of day, there's a lot of patterns too. And so really, it, I think it comes down to more of an event-driven basis. And this is kind of our assumption of sorts here, um, trying to think of what the airlines are doing. But really, I think the tailoring of the traffic is probably more event-based. In other words, we have a snowstorm coming, or we have a high risk of severe weather and organized thunderstorms. So we may make some modifications uh, to our schedule 
as well, but I don't know so much yeah, about seasonal. So, so if they know of a snowstorm in three days, they will start canceling. But from a seasonal um, standpoint, this is Rob, you know, and I worked at United Airlines for about nine years, so I certainly didn't see any um, adjust in the schedule from a seasonal standpoint. The, the thing that drove the schedule was basically what was the customer demand. So, for example, um, in the winter here we've got a customer, the demand that wants to get to Denver to go skiing, that wants to get out to some of the the airports in the West to ski. So, um, so they will they will adjust their schedule based on what the customer wants. Okay, and then thanks. the weather comes into play. Doug writes in, he wants to know if you could explain a little more about wind shear on final approach and what, what causes the wind shear. Sure, you bet. Um, kind of um, stepping away from like the microburst wind shear, just kind of more of a general wind shear. Um, kind of what we're looking at, um, the most common scenario for wind shear on a final approach might be, um, say, at 2,000 or 3,000 feet, above the surface, say we might have 50 mile an hour winds, okay? Now the plane is flying into that wind and um, it's doing okay, but as that aircraft descends to maybe closer to its final approach, maybe coming from 3,000 feet to 1,000 feet, generally what we see is we see that wind speed dropping off. So we might go from 50 mile an hour to 15 or 20 mile an hour. So it's that drop in wind speed on that, say on this particular scenario on the final approach, um, what, what that does is that decreases the aircraft lift. So that is basically what wind shear is. It's sensing that decrease in speed. We had good lift. Now we don't have as much lift. We don't have as much wind hitting the, the wings of the aircraft. So that's kind of the basic phenomenon when we talk about like wind shear on final approach. Thanks. Here's one actually from an old friend of ours, uh, Mark, who's a, a TV meteorologist up in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, and he, he wants to know who makes the final call to keep flying through a storm, the pilot or the airline or the airport. He, he thinks about the little, looking back at the Little Rock crash and who makes the call to divert. Well, ultimately it's the, it's the pilot's decision whether he, will, he or she will land the aircraft, um, but there are other factors that come into play. Um, you know, like a microburst. I mean, if if the airport is sensing 50 mile an hour winds, um, that's reported to the pilot. He will have the final say. But there's other factors such as um, a tower evacuation. Um, say we have a, a gust front coming and the tower, you know, we have reports of 70 mile an hour. That in essence will shut the airport down. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, um, there are rules at certain airports for lightning, and if there is cloud-to-ground lightning um, impacting the airport, so basically, um, like here in Chicago, lightning was within five miles of the airport, basically the ground crews, they, they will not be on the tarmac. So there's a lot of factors that come into play. Ultimately, the pilot has a final say, but um, other factors come into play as well. Now, would that be as, as far as, as flying through the storm, too, as, uh, not as far as landing or taking off, but actually you you're see the storm out ahead of you, uh, do I go around it, do I go through it, uh, that, that kind of factor? And that's a coordinated effort. Yeah, now that specific um, scenario would be coordinated between the pilot and then the air traffic controller at the, at the specific center, and you know, any certain, for example, if they're going to fly through rain, um, that's not a problem. They'll fly through snow, um, but it's really the updrafts, downdrafts, and the radar scope that the controllers use, certain thresholds of radar, what we call reflectivity, or radar return, signal to them that this is, this is a thunderstorm. Um, it may have updrafts, downdrafts, so it's kind of a standing order that they're going to avoid that, so the, the controller here at the surface will, you know, will deviate that aircraft um, accordingly. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, we've got another one here. Uh, Nancy writes in and she wants to know, uh, on your final slide you talked about wind speeds uh, aloft. How are wind speeds measured and determined at high levels of the atmosphere? There are several ways. Um, one of the main ways is 
through weather balloons, or radio sounds we call them, and those are measured twice a day, basically at 0Z and 12Z across the country and really across the world. Um, so that's obviously not that frequent, but that's kind of the, one of the bases for the information that we can model. So the soundings, those profiles that Rob showed were, were based off of a, a model analysis, so it's first guess of what's happening right now. Uh, aircraft, however, are equipped with, uh, many of them are equipped with sensors that can calculate and determine the wind speed and direction. And that's the map that we've got up on the screen now. That's actually uh, based off of aircraft data in, as, it's flying, as they're flying through uh, the various levels of the atmosphere to tell us what the wind speed and direction are. So that's, that's a, a, in terms of an actual measurement, uh, those are kind of the main ways that we have. Otherwise, we're kind of looking at model-derived fields to give us a forecast or an analysis, you know, what's happening in the next one, two, three hours, but then a longer-term forecast of what those winds are going to do as well. We also have the capability of measuring uh, winds at each radar site, um, depending if there are scatters in the atmosphere, things like clouds or other particles that uh, we can get what we call the, the bad wind profile. Maybe you've heard that term if you read maybe forecast discussions or SPC discussions. That's another way that we can see winds, primarily in the low levels uh, in terms of better accuracy and better quality, but they can see winds up through quite a layer as well even without storms present. Jim from Georgia wants to know about lightning. It's flying through lightning and uh, are planes struck and then uh, what is a typical air aircraft in-flight damage uh, that happens uh, to a plane if it does fly and get hit with lightning? Yeah, you know, generally um, that's one element of a thunderstorm that um, is really not that big of a problem. Aircraft certainly do get struck by lightning. It's, it, it happens occasionally. Um, it's not really a hazard, though. Um, just the, the way the aircraft is built um, and just the, the way that the lightning distributes itself across the entire frame of the aircraft, um, it's generally not a problem. Um, so again, they, they do get struck. They, they will have to pull the aircraft just to you know, make sure that there's not damage to maybe a wing, but we certainly don't see a lot of incidences where that causes a you know an accident, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Uh, James writes in. He wants to know: Is there a website where predicted or daily hourly wind conditions can be accessed by the public? And if there is, maybe you can send that to me afterwards. We'll put it up. Uh, we'll have a resource spot on our web page uh, for this webinar with uh, other things you might think are important too, which we can send those URLs. Um, there are a couple options. Uh, in terms of surface winds, uh, all the Weather Service local forecast offices do produce hourly wind speed and direction as well as gust forecasts that go out seven days actually. And so if you go to uh, weather.gov, put in your zip code for the area that you're interested in, um, you'll come up with a local forecast and then towards the bottom of the page there should be an option for what they call the hourly weather graph. Um, and that will give you a plot of hourly winds at that particular location out to as many as seven days. Um, there's also a graphical option that you should see on there too that will give you more of an aerial view over a region or a state uh, that you can zoom or leap forward in time. I think those might be three hour time steps though. Now in terms of vertical winds, um, there's probably some model forecast data that would be accessible um, yeah, and there's on a, the web. Yeah, there's certainly a couple of websites and we can kind of post those later to Henry. Uh, there's a couple of sites that will actually allow you to pick your flight level, whether it's 8,000 feet or 30,000 feet, um, pick that level and, and pick that level out into time, out to 30 hours or more, and it'll display your winds over a certain geographic area. So th those, do, um, those, those systems are available for the public, yes. Gents, I know we're a little bit after the hour. We've got some more questions. Do you have time to take a few more questions? Are we? Yeah, I think we've got time for maybe two or three more. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's take a few more. And then those we don't answer, we'll try to get those answered off the air for you. Uh, here's one here. Uh, Terry's been waiting on this question from Wyoming. Can you comment on clean, clear air, air turbulence? Uh, recently, aircraft inbound to Billings encountered clear air turbulence ca causing several passenger and crew injuries and so what is cat what what is uh, where would you find that and and so forth yeah you know if uh, basically um, if you look at the um, really 
the, this particular graphic here, which shows the different wind barbs, this would be clear air turbulence. If an aircraft is flying, you know, through this corridor of of, of wind, um, with those changing wind speeds, there's nothing. And so, basically, when we say clear air, there's basically nothing visible uh, that really shows this um, for the pilot. So. Um, that's really what it is. It's something you cannot see um, is really the basic definition of it. Now, uh, as a forecaster, sometimes wind or sometimes moisture might get entrained into a jet stream, okay? And that's where us as a forecaster can see this. Now, would this be considered clear air turbulence? Well, yeah. I mean, there's some cirrus clouds that are in it. Um, from a pilot standpoint, um, he's flying through a cirrus cloud um, in one spot in the atmosphere where, as a forecaster standpoint, I can see these, these ripples in the clouds from the satellite, but to a pilot's perspective, he's kind of in the clear, meaning he's not near any thunderstorms. Um, so that's really what, what that refers to. Okay, thanks. Here's one from Lloyd uh, in Palmyra, New York. Do aircraft have to do aircraft have to worry about static buildup during flight? Well, that one's a little bit beyond my scientific knowledge. Um, yeah, same here. <laughs> I, I don't want to give you. I just be winging that one, so I don't want to wing it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see if we can get one more in here uh, before we have to leave. And uh, I guess Penn was asking, uh, do you have much much interaction? Uh, excuse me, interaction, uh, uh, feedback from from live bodies. So you're talking to different folks, or you just exclusively do finished forecast products. So are you in interaction with the uh, airlines as forecasters? Do you talk uh, to interactions? So yeah, interactions becoming a bigger part of of our job at the Weather Service uh, for aviation as well as our other programs, so with like emergency management, uh, with media and so forth. So uh, in terms of our office here, we do have, uh, it's not scheduled, but we have fairly regular communication with uh, RFA partners here in particular. Now, since they kind of drive the operation at the airport, uh, we're giving them briefings about, hey, we've got significant weather today, and significant could be we've got you know, lowers, lowering ceilings, or we have a wind shift, or we have a lake breeze, we have thunderstorms. So we do have pretty frequent, uh, let's say, on-shift communication with them. Uh, as we do, we have routine uh, communication with between the center forecaster like Rob or the WFO forecaster like myself. Uh, and then we send our channels, that message out to our channel, so we finish products, but also verbally. Um, in addition to that, We've been doing a lot more user training um, in terms of here's how best to use this information. So it's not just on shift type communication, but it's even ahead of time, seasonal type training. Uh, we do provide talks for uh, local general aviation type groups like EAA groups, um, other flight clubs and so forth may have us come in and talk about the weather as well. So that, that's one part of the preparedness aspect and the understanding of uh, how to get the information, how to use it. And then knowing the hazards is, is you know, as critical as having that latest forecast. So uh, I kind of see two different rounds of communication, and both of which we're involved in. Now with the airlines, um, it's not so routine, let's say. Some of the airlines do have forecasters at their companies. Some are contracted. Uh, we may have occasional interaction with them if there's questions, uh, maybe on an interpretation of our forecast. Uh, or if you need to collaborate. There are some offices that may collaborate with some airline meteorologists, just depending on their operational needs at the airline. So uh, primary communication from our end, verbal, let's say, is with the FAA, and then there may be some interaction with the airline community as well. Okay, thanks, guys. I, I've got one last question for you uh, about snow. Uh, we, we really didn't cover too much about snow affecting the operations at an airport. But what is the, what is the toughest parts? Is it taking off in snow with the uh, buildup on the wings? Is it landing where you can't see the runway, the visibility? Uh, what, I know it causes airports to close down. What 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 is the what is the trickiest part of that? I think probably um, there's some of all those factors, but I think probably the biggest one is being able to land the aircraft 
and in other words, being able to stop. Um, runway conditions are, are a huge factor, and from a forecast perspective, uh, there's been more and more need for good snow intensity information, snowfall accumulation intensity information, because the airport authority can use that to kind of plan uh, when they're going to have to close a runway to clear it, to plow the snow and broom the snow off. And so they're coordinating that with the FAA as well because the FAA has to know which runways are going to be operable when. So that's probably one of the biggest safety risks in a snowstorm um, is being able to have that, that ability to break or stop the aircraft once they reach the ground. Now, the forecasting of those elements is, is kind of in its infancy, really. Uh, you know, that's why things like Coco Ross reports of, of snow accumulation and liquid equivalent uh, is going to become more important as we hopefully start to research some of these things to help us better forecast it. But in terms of other situations, you know, winds. Uh, obviously, big snowstorms can bring strong winds. The direction is going to be critical. That's going to factor into the ability to uh, safely put the aircraft on the ground and the, the time it takes to stop and so forth. Um, so I think you go into the other factors as well. Yeah, just adding to what Mike said uh, about some of the observing. Um, one of the big things that the airports really want to know is what's the snowfall rate an hour? Is it going to be quarter inch an hour? Because that means something to them. They they can do something with that. They can plan their snow removal. They can um, they can have an expectation of what like what we call the braking action might be. So certainly, more observations we have, the better. Um, and what one of the big drivers is braking action. So these pilot reports. Um, they will land and they will report breaking action good, breaking action fair. Once once there's a report of breaking action poor, that runway becomes they will not use it. So stopping the aircraft, as Mike had mentioned, is really the a big factor. So they will once they get that poor report, they've got to go clean the runway, treat it, and um, get it ready to to bring that breaking action to a better, you know good. And it's also important to know that that. Uh, you know, things like the visibility and the ceilings that we talked about before will be driving the operation in these snow events as well and have likely some relationship with the snow intensity. So, um, you know, you can't necessarily just because maybe the ceiling's okay, the visibility is okay, but you're getting snow accumulation, you might not be able to run the same arrival rate that you would on a clear day. Um, so they kind of all play together in, in terms of determining what the operation is going to be. Could, could you depart? I mean, uh, departure. Would that? Is there much problem with departure with the snowstorms? Could you? Is it affect takeoff? Yeah, at all? Um, certainly. Certainly, departure is an issue. Um, and, and the big thing is having the aircrafts clean, having those wings clean of any type of debris, snow, so the so so they have the proper lift they need. So that becomes a big um, situation as far as like snowfall intensity. If 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 we're you know, receiving like an inch snowfall an hour, every aircraft that has any snow on that wing needs to be de-iced. So there's something called like a holdover time where an aircraft is de-iced, it needs to depart pretty quickly. It can't be waiting around for a half hour uh, to build up snow again. So uh, departure becomes a big issue with snow intensity as well. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. This was uh, really eye-opening on a lot of a lot of aspects. and. Uh, uh, thank you for taking the time uh, for all this interesting information you're able to pass on. So we really appreciate it. Well, we thank you for the opportunity and, and thank the audience for their, their interest and their attention and, of course, all their, their Coco Ross reports as well. We use those all the time across the Weather Service. We certainly appreciate the effort to, uh, to provide those. Well, that's great. Uh, for our audience out there, please join us for our next Kokoros Weather Talk webinar, and that'll be coming up in several weeks on Thursday, June 19th. You want to mark this one on your calendar. It's going to be about water spouts, and uh, it, it is the Joe Golden. Uh, he's a, our uh, water spout expert from Boulder, Colorado. He'll be talking about this wet whirlwind cousin of the tornado. So make sure you're you're. We'll have a place to uh, you can sign up for that on our website as well. Uh, finally, before you leave today, please take the, the survey at the end of the, today's webinar. That really helps out, uh, let us, lets us know how we're doing, and, and uh, the feedback uh, goes to our presenters as well. Well, on behalf of the Kokoros crew here in Fort Collins, Colorado, we wish you a good afternoon and have a good weekend ahead. Take care.